Can you go to the hospital by yourself? I promise, I'll take care of everything. My name is Emily, and I'm about to have a baby for the first time. I'm last month's pregnant. Although I'm nervous, I'm also very happy to be adding to our family. My husband Mark works a desk job and has weekends off, but he doesn't help much at home or with shopping. He often visits his parents' house on weekends because they live close by and he's very close to them. He doesn't really have a reason, he just goes. Since I got pregnant, I've been careful not to lift heavy things. When I need to buy something heavy like rice, my friends help me. Every day, I wake up early to make breakfast for Mark and say goodbye when he leaves for work. Then I clean the house, do laundry, and go shopping if I need to. After I come back, I start making dinner. Once everything is done, I can relax. I'm on maternity leave now, so I've started a new hobby, blogging. I write about my day and post pictures of things like my food, the blue sky, and flowers in my garden. My friends and people I know leave comments, and this has become a fun part of my day. One evening, while I was making dinner, Mark came home. He left his bag and jacket on the sofa, so I picked them up and hung them up. I told him I made hamburgers for dinner and that I was going to take a bath. He just went to the bathroom without saying much. We've been married for four years, but he's not very kind or thoughtful. I sometimes wonder if this is normal for marriage, but I've gotten used to it. After his bath, I gave Mark a drink. He asked where the beer was, looking at the bar. I said I forgot to buy it and would get some tomorrow. He got angry and told me to go to the store right now. I was upset. Why did he expect his pregnant wife to go out for him? If he wanted it so badly, he could have gone himself. It's difficult for me to walk around with my big belly. He got even more upset and yelled at me, saying it was my fault for forgetting and that being pregnant doesn't mean I get treated differently. He believes staying active is good for health. Because he doesn't calm down easily, I decided to go to the store anyway. At the store, I ran into Sandra, a neighbor. She was in a good mood, which made me feel a bit better. I told her about my husband wanting beer and not understanding why he couldn't get it himself. Sandra seemed to sympathize with my situation. After chatting, we went our separate ways. When I got back, Mark was just sitting there, not having cleaned up after dinner. He asked why I took so long and demanded the beer. His harsh words hurt me, but I gave him the beer and started cleaning without saying anything. I couldn't believe he could be so unkind, especially now. I didn't want to argue, so I kept quiet, had my bath, and went to bed. The next morning, Mark acted like nothing happened. He doesn't hold on to things like I do. He noticed I was upset and told me to be nicer since he was going to work. He talked about the importance of being grateful, which made me want to point out he should practice what he preaches, but I was too shocked to say anything. I just watched him leave, saying he wouldn't be home for dinner. After he left, I went about my day as usual, but his words stayed with me. I decided to make something simple just for myself. Then, as evening approached and I was about to eat alone, I was surprised by Mark's unexpected return. I hurried to greet him. He thanked me but mentioned his surprise visit was due to his plans being cancelled. He was hungry, expecting dinner, but I had only prepared enough for myself. Mark's reaction was immediate and filled with frustration. He couldn't believe I hadn't considered the possibility of his return, expecting a meal waiting for him. His disappointment grew when he saw the modest dinner I had set out for myself, questioning the effort and care I put into my role at home. He criticized my cooking and suggested I take lessons from his mother, implying her skills were vastly superior. This comparison to his mother, a recurring theme in his critiques, deeply hurt me. He then demanded I go out and buy something for him to eat, ignoring the fact that it was already late and I had settled in for the night. Faced with his anger and unreasonable demands, I felt an overwhelming sense of dismay. When I hesitated, pointing out the impracticality of his request, Mark's patience snapped. 
he reminded me of my previous oversights, like forgetting to buy beer, and declared his intention to return to his parents' house out of frustration, leaving me alone. His departure, though abrupt, brought an unexpected relief. However, the next day, this brief respite was shattered by a call from Mark's mother, chastising me for not preparing a meal for her son. Her accusation of what she deemed as near-moral harassment was difficult to hear. I attempted to explain the situation, but faced with her unwavering stance, I ended the conversation with an apology, feeling disheartened. With Mark away, I allowed myself a leisurely late brunch, a small act of self-care amid the turmoil. Yet the prospect of his return loomed over me, tinted with the anticipation of further conflict. Determined to bridge the gap, I resolved to make an exceptional dinner that evening. I shopped with care, selecting ingredients for a special meal, and ensuring to include Mark's preferred beer, aiming to mend fences through a gesture of goodwill. I shortened my daily blogging ritual to dedicate more time to cooking, pouring my effort into preparing a meal that would surpass Mark's expectations. The table was set meticulously, reflecting both my dedication and a hopeful step towards reconciliation. As I surveyed the scene, a sense of accomplishment washed over me. In this effort, I found not only a means to potentially appease Mark, but also a moment of self-validation. I hoped that this dinner, a symbol of my effort and care, would be met with appreciation, marking a step towards understanding and mutual respect. I waited for Mark in the dining room, but he didn't come home. I tried calling him many times on my phone, but got no answer, which made me worry. Hours passed, and I thought maybe he went to his parents' house. They hadn't seen him either, it was getting late and I was about to call the police when Mark finally came home, very drunk. He fell in the hallway, and when I went to help, he yelled at me to go away and not to touch him. He insulted me, and it hurt a lot. I couldn't understand why he couldn't be kinder. I had made dinner with so much care, but it was all wasted. I ended up eating alone, feeling very sad. The next morning, Mark acted like nothing happened. He complained about his headache and questioned why I left him in the hallway. I reminded him that he chose to lie there. He seemed to think it was my job to look after him, even when he was drunk, and hadn't told me he wouldn't be home for dinner. He said his plans changed last minute and didn't think he needed to tell me. His excuses made me feel even more distant from him. I decided I needed a break and planned to go to my parents' house the next day. Being around Mark had become hard and unenjoyable. His lack of respect made me think about divorce, especially with our baby on the way. I was excited about the baby but sad about our relationship. I've heard from friends that giving birth can be tough, but I'm more excited than worried about meeting my baby. My neighbors cheer me up by saying it won't be long now. One day, Mark mentioned his parents wanted us to go on a trip with them. This surprised me because Mark's parents and I don't always get along. They often take Mark's side in any disagreement. Mark insisted that being pregnant doesn't mean I can't travel and that everything was arranged for a short trip next week, which is close to my due date. I felt this was too much and tried to object, but Mark wouldn't listen. I talked to a friend about it, who agreed it was unreasonable. When the day to leave arrived, I said I wasn't feeling well and wanted to stay home, but Mark insisted I'd be fine in the car. As we were getting ready to leave, I realized my water had broken. I told Mark we needed to go to the hospital right away. He was surprised and then, strangely, he told me to get out of the car because I was making a mess. I couldn't believe he was more concerned about the car than getting me to the hospital. Mark told me to get out of the car because he needed to clean it. And then, shockingly, he pulled me out and drove off, saying I should go to the hospital by myself. I was too surprised to react. Quickly, I called for an ambulance, and that's when Sandra, a neighbor, came over and saw I was in trouble. She helped me get a special taxi to the hospital, comforting me on the way. I was thankful for her support and cried a bit from the relief of her kindness. 
As Sandra stayed with me at the hospital, I quietly promised myself that Mark would regret his actions. Sandra held my hand, keeping me calm until my parents arrived. They looked worried, and Sandra said she needed to talk to them about something. Then, I started having more intense labor pains. My phone rang, and it was Mark calling. My parents didn't look happy but handed me the phone. Mark sounded panicked, asking for help, but I couldn't deal with him right then and hung up. Despite turning off my phone, Mark kept sending messages. Eventually, I was taken to the delivery room, and after some time, I heard my baby crying. I was so tired but happy to see my parents and Sandra with me. After sleeping for a bit, I woke up in my hospital bed. My parents were there, looking concerned. I asked about the baby, and they said the baby was fine and would be back with me soon. Sandra had left, but I felt so grateful for her help. I promised my parents that things would change once we got home. I decided to visit Sandra later to thank her. When I turned on my phone, I saw a lot of missed calls from Mark, which surprised me, but I didn't feel any hope from them, so I just ignored them. A friend came to see me in the hospital to celebrate the birth of my baby. As we talked, I told her about what happened with Mark. She was shocked and even joked about wanting to scold him. She made sure I knew resting and my health were most important, then she left. My parents, already knowing the full story from Sandra, asked me what I planned to do next. I told them I was thinking about getting a divorce, and they supported my decision. I decided to stay with my parents after leaving the hospital. Mark tried to visit me at the hospital, but I had told the staff I didn't want to see him, so they didn't let him in. The next day, Sandra visited with a fruit basket. I was so happy to see her. She reminded me to take it easy because getting tired after having a baby is common. I thanked her a lot for her help and said I didn't know what I would have done without her. Sandra told me it was most important that me and the baby were healthy and she was glad to help. I promised to thank her properly once everything calmed down. Sandra mentioned she had told her husband about what happened and he was very upset. I felt bad for involving her in my problems. Then Sandra revealed something surprising, she was actually the wife of the CEO at the company where Mark works. We became neighbors when we first moved here. This made me realize just how much I had brought Sandra into this situation. I didn't know that Sandra was the CEO's wife. We met often at the local stores and started having tea together. That's how I learned about her husband's important job. My husband didn't know any of this because he never joined me in meeting our neighbors and didn't like to socialize. Sandra once asked me not to tell my husband about her identity because she didn't want to cause any trouble, and I agreed. With my difficult situation at home, Sandra offered to talk to her husband about it, but I didn't want to bother her. After what happened recently, it seems that Sandra decided she had to act, which is why my husband was trying to reach her. I'm really grateful to Sandra for her support. She told me I was a dear friend and she couldn't just watch me suffer. Even though my husband kept sending messages, I ignored them, focusing on my future with my baby. Just before leaving the hospital, a friend showed me a social media post about my situation. She has many followers and had shared a video someone took of me being yelled at by my husband when he made me get out of the car. My face was blurred for privacy, but the video got a lot of attention, and people figured out who my husband and his company were. Now he's facing a lot of criticism online. I was shocked to learn how much attention the situation with my husband had gotten online. My friend, seeing my surprise, simply said that my husband and his actions were his own doing. The story had spread so much that even my husband's friends knew about it. He tried to excuse his behavior by saying he had plans with his parents, which led to criticism of them too. Stories about my husband's parents started appearing online as well. Then, my mother-in-law called me. My friend suggested I should answer and speak my mind, but I was too overwhelmed and chose to ignore the call. Soon, my missed calls were full of attempts for my husband and his parents to reach me. The hospital staff knew about my situation and supported me, 
ensuring I wasn't disturbed by my husband or his parents. As my discharge day came, I worried about encountering my husband and his parents outside the hospital. My parents assured me there was nothing to worry about. On the day I was leaving, I heard my husband and in-laws calling out to me. Suddenly, men in black suits formed a barrier around me, making me feel safe. They were there to protect me on someone's orders, and my mom reassured me once more, saying I had nothing to fear. With their protection, my husband and his parents couldn't get close as I got into the car safely. I'm really thankful for Sandra's help and have been thinking about how to thank her properly. My parents agree and want to show our gratitude too. Even though I've started a new chapter and am enjoying better days, my husband and his parents keep trying to contact me. I sent them divorce papers, but they didn't seem ready to accept them. Once, when they called and spoke rudely to my dad, he got upset and they ended the call quickly. We decided to get help from a lawyer, who was a friend of my dad's. The lawyer was willing to help us after we told him about the situation and the video that was shared online. When the lawyer contacted my husband on our behalf, my husband was surprised and then stubborn, insisting we could solve our issues without a lawyer but the lawyer made it clear he was representing me, and it was my choice to involve him. My husband didn't want to agree to the divorce at first, but the mention of possibly going to court made him change his mind. He said he didn't care about our child and didn't see why he should pay child support or how we split our things, claiming he did nothing wrong. The lawyer explained the legal side, but my husband was still not convinced until the lawyer mentioned court which made my in-laws agree to the terms quickly. I was stunned by my husband's attitude and couldn't believe I had married him. I've been talking to Sandra about everything, and she jokingly suggested we could go after my ex-husband's retirement money as a way to get back at him. Sandra's cleverness really surprised me. The lawyer told me my husband wanted to say sorry in person, but I chose to talk over the phone with the lawyer there. My parents were with me when he called. He started by blaming me for everything, saying his life was falling apart and it was all my fault. He even asked me to come back to him, saying he'd forgive me. I stayed calm, and when he insulted me again, I told him we were recording the call to use as evidence. He was shocked and quickly changed his tune, claiming he was joking and couldn't live without me. I hung up and gave the recording to the lawyer, who couldn't believe my husband's behavior. My parents and I were sure we wanted nothing more to do with him. There was a strange part of me that found this situation slightly amusing. The divorce went smoothly, with no problems in dividing our property or arranging child support. Thanks to Sandra telling her husband, who is my ex-husband's boss, about what happened, he faced consequences at work. The boss values family and didn't take kindly to my ex-husband's actions. Mark couldn't keep his job after what happened. Without work, he couldn't pay for his house and had to move back in with his parents. The video that went around made it hard for him to get a good job, so he just did small jobs here and there. People also started talking about his parents, making them feel uncomfortable in their own community. This situation was tough for them, maybe even tougher than dealing with any legal trouble. After things calmed down and I was feeling better, my family and I went to thank Sandra and her husband. They were really kind to us, especially to my baby, making us feel welcome. Soon, Sandra and my mom became good friends, and our dads got along well too. Sandra and her husband have a son who is about my age, and surprisingly, we started getting closer. A few years later, it looked like I might become part of Sandra's family which was something nobody expected. Life can really surprise you sometimes. Several years ago, I faced the toughest battle of my life when I was diagnosed with advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. This news was completely unexpected, as I had always lived a healthy lifestyle, complete with regular exercise, a balanced diet, and annual checkups. The oncologist explained that the causes of this type of cancer were not fully understood, and although the prognosis included a slim chance of survival, Aggressive chemotherapy could potentially save my life. Determined to fight, 
I gathered my wife of 18 years, Megan, and our teenage daughter, Kelly, to share the daunting news. Their initial reaction was one of devastation, but I tried to instill hope, promising to do everything in my power to overcome the illness. Despite this, I was deeply concerned about the impact the diagnosis and subsequent treatment would have on our family dynamics. The doctor had cautioned that the side effects of chemotherapy could strain even the strongest relationships, and he noted that many marriages struggle under such stress. That evening, I shared these fears with Megan, who reassured me of her unwavering support through my illness. We were in a stable financial position, thanks to my comprehensive insurance, significant savings, and a trust fund left by my late grandfather. Our home was fully paid off, and I had even secured funds for Kelly's college education, should anything happen to me. Chemotherapy began a week later and proved to be extremely grueling. Each session left me so exhausted and debilitated that it felt as though I had been struck by a freight train. I found myself unable to manage even the simplest tasks, such as feeding myself or taking a shower. Megan and Kelly became my pillars during this time, taking over household duties, driving me to medical appointments, and ensuring I had the necessary medications. They truly stepped up in a time of dire need. For three challenging months, I tried to keep my burdens to myself and help out around the house whenever I felt strong enough. However, I started noticing a change in my wife and daughter's behavior. Their willingness to assist me gradually diminished, and even simple requests like getting a glass of water or some fresh air seemed to irritate them. My daughter began to ignore my requests entirely. The tension peaked one morning when I was running late for an early chemotherapy session. My wife was still upstairs, and when I called to her, she suggested tiredly that I take an Uber because she needed a rest. Shocked by her response, I managed to arrange for both the ride and hospital support on my own. Thankfully, the Uber driver was exceptionally kind and even offered to bring me back home after the session. It was a relief, yet disheartening to depend so heavily on a stranger's kindness. Later that day, after some rest, I gathered the courage to address the growing distance between us. The air was chilly as I confronted my wife and daughter about their recent behavior. I asked them outright if they felt burdened by me. My wife sighed deeply and confessed that they were both feeling overwhelmed. My daughter timidly admitted that my needs during the illness were more than she had anticipated. Realizing we needed a solution, I proposed hiring a nurse for a few days each week to help with daily tasks and accompany me to my chemotherapy appointments. To prepare for days when I might be particularly weak, I'd also ordered a wheelchair. They both agreed to this plan. I contacted the hospital for recommendations, and they sent a nurse who was both kind and firm. She managed my appointments, ensured I took my medication, and even prepared healthy meals. With her help, my condition improved, which pleased my doctors. Despite these adjustments aimed at reducing their load, my wife and daughter still seemed unhappy. My wife felt increasingly sidelined by the nurse's presence. I suggested that if she felt ready to resume the responsibilities of caring for me, including taking me to my appointments, managing my medication, and ensuring I ate properly, we could consider letting the nurse go. This was the only reason I had suggested hiring help to ease the strain on us all. I brought in a nurse because my condition had become overwhelming for my wife to manage alone, and she reluctantly accepted this temporary solution. She suggested we look for a male nurse, but I explained that the hospital's list only included the nurse we had, who was specifically chosen for her expertise with cancer patients and her familiarity with my needs. This nurse was thorough, considerate, and showed great respect towards my family. I made it clear that the only condition under which we would consider replacing the nurse was if my wife and daughter were prepared to take over her duties. My wife was unhappy with this idea and suggested that I should be more self-reliant instead of letting my illness impact everyone else. I tried to explain that there were days when my condition left me too weak to even get out of bed, let alone handle daily tasks on my own. The chemotherapy had severely weakened me. In frustration, my wife stormed off and shoved herself upstairs, slamming doors in her wake. I decided to ignore her outburst, knowing that any negativity could only set back my recovery. My primary focus had to stay on regaining my health. Later that evening, my mother-in-law, who lived three states away, called to express her concern about having another woman in her daughter's house, despite the fact that the house was legally mine since I had purchased it before our marriage. I took a diplomatic approach in explaining the situation. I told her that the level of care I needed was more than my wife could handle on her own, and the nurse was here to lessen the strain on everyone. I reassured her that the nurse's stay was only meant to last through the remaining month of my chemotherapy, 
assuming no complications arose. While she seemed skeptical, she eventually ended the call, which was a relief to me. For about a week after that conversation, life went on fairly normally. My treatment proceeded without incident, and it seemed like we might be able to maintain a semblance of normality, until one eventful day after I returned from a chemotherapy session. When I returned from my latest chemotherapy session, a moving truck parked in front of my house was the first thing I saw. My wife and daughter had packed all their belongings and were preparing to move to my mother-in-law's house. I was deeply hurt and upset, but the sheer exhaustion from the treatment kept me from fully expressing my emotions. The timing of their departure, right after a chemo session when I was most vulnerable, seemed particularly harsh. Seeking some understanding, I turned to my daughter. I asked her if she really wanted to leave, considering she was old enough to decide for herself. Her response was heartbreaking. She told me that she found it too difficult to be around me during my illness and preferred to live with her mother. Watching them drive away, I felt a profound sense of abandonment, which was one of my biggest fears when I started chemotherapy. In the midst of this emotional upheaval, my brother offered his support. He had noticed the nurse spending extra time with me that day and asked if I had any family nearby who could help. Although he lived five hours away and had his own family responsibilities, he didn't hesitate to take some time off work to stay with me. Upon his arrival, he was visibly upset about my wife's actions, calling her selfish and ungrateful. He reminded me that throughout our marriage, I had ensured she never had to work and always had everything she needed. His leave was only for a week, but he proposed another solution. His sister-in-law, Hannah, was in the middle of a difficult divorce and needed the safe place to stay. Hannah was studying radiology on a scholarship at a nearby university, and my house was conveniently closer to her campus than her current residence. We agreed that Hannah could stay with me. It would give her a place to escape the stress of her divorce, and I would have someone around in case of emergencies. I assured my brother that Hannah wouldn't have to worry about rent her company was more than enough compensation. She could pick any of the remaining rooms, I wasn't particular, as my wife and daughter had taken most of our belongings. Hannah moved in on the day my brother had to return home. He helped her settle in, and she was incredibly grateful for the opportunity to stay. She promised to be considerate, keep the place tidy, and help out wherever needed. Hannah was genuinely kind-hearted, and having her around brought a new sense of calm and companionship to the house during a challenging time in my life. I reassured Hannah that she wouldn't need to take on too much responsibility since I had arranged for my nurse to come in every day of the week, an increase from the previous schedule of four days. After my brother left, I did my best to help Hannah settle into her new surroundings. Over the next few weeks, life found a sort of equilibrium. I missed my wife and daughter deeply, but it seemed I was alone in that sentiment, as they hadn't reached out to me at all. Hannah was incredibly helpful during this period. She took on the grocery shopping handled most of the cleaning, and even helped prepare meals. She never complained, and her presence was both a comfort and a support. About a month and a half after my family left, I received incredible news. I was cancer-free. I celebrated by ringing the bell at the hospital, a significant milestone. My nurse, curious about my next steps, asked what I planned to do now that I was free from cancer. The answer was clear to me. I decided to file for divorce, seeking to free myself from a marriage that had lacked support during my most challenging times. With the divorce proceedings underway, my attention turned to recovery. It was a journey in itself. Gradually, I began to regain my strength, my hair grew back, scars began to heal, and I started gaining weight. I maintained a healthy diet, but allowed myself the occasional indulgence, enjoying the meals I had missed during my treatment. Eight months have passed since I was declared cancer-free, and I feel ready to move forward. I contacted my old job, and they offered to rehire me for remote work. I plan to accept, as I am also considering relocating. Despite my attachment to my current home, it holds too many painful memories. I'm looking for a fresh start in a smaller, quieter place. Unbeknownst to my wife, I intend to give the house to Hannah. She was there for me when I was at my lowest, showing immense kindness despite us being practically strangers. I want her to have the freedom to do with the house as she pleases, including selling it if she chooses. I no longer have any ties to it, especially if it might become a point of contention with my wife or daughter. I found a new place in a tranquil neighborhood in the countryside, and I am truly excited about this new chapter in my life. This is update number one on my journey towards a new beginning. Hello, wife and daughter. It's been more than a year since my initial diagnosis, and I've comfortably settled into my new neighborhood. This community is full of welcoming people, 
and have become good friends with several neighbors, including Teresa, who lives across the street. Teresa is a widow whose children live far away, visiting only during holidays like Christmas and her birthday. One evening, Teresa invited me over for drinks on her porch. We shared stories, and she told me about her husband's battle with lung cancer and how life insurance had been a crucial support for her family. During our conversation, I opened up about my situation with you both. Surprisingly, I still haven't heard from either of you, but I've made peace with that. I've been filling my time with new hobbies, especially woodworking, and I'm gradually building up my collection of tools. Today, after coming back from the hardware store, Teresa mentioned that she had seen some people lingering around my house. They didn't do anything suspicious, but they knocked a few times, looked around, and waited in their car for a while. Teresa thought about calling the sheriff but held off, suspecting they might be family. When she described them, I realized she was talking about you too. I'm puzzled about how you found my new address, since only my brother and his wife know where I live. Teresa promised that if you returned, she would handle it and advise me not to confront you, given your abandonment during my toughest times. That night, I called my brother, who informed me that you had been causing trouble for Hannah and her roommate at my old house. Thankfully, Hannah had all the necessary documents to prove her ownership, which she had purchased from me. A wise decision on her part. Feeling sorry that Hannah had to endure this because of my family, I called her to apologize. If there's another visit, I hope to resolve the situation permanently. Regarding the divorce, my lawyer sent the documents to your mother's house, but they might have been dismissed as junk mail. At this point, I'm moving on, as our relationship is effectively over. Update number two, you showed up again at my house, but earlier in the day while I was working remotely. When I heard the knock, I immediately turned to my security cameras to confirm my suspicion it was indeed them. My ex-wife appeared unchanged, but Kelly had matured into a young woman. Following the plan Teresa and I had discussed, I stayed indoors, but moved closer to the door to better hear the exchange. Teresa, always the helpful neighbor, approached them to introduce herself. My wife inquired if she knew a man named James who used to live there. Teresa seemed as perplexed as I felt and questioned the phrasing used to. My wife then claimed that her husband, referring to me, not as her ex-husband, had lived here before his recent, untimely death after an extended hospital stay. I was astounded by this false narrative, as there was absolutely no record of my death, especially not at the hospital where I received my treatment. My wife further asserted that they were the rightful next of kin, implying ownership of the home. Teresa corrected her by stating that a James did indeed live there, but he was a divorcee. She also mentioned that during our time as neighbors, I had informed her of my wife leaving and my filing for a unilateral divorce. Teresa added that as far as she knew, I had planned to leave all my assets to charity since my only family was my brother. This revelation seemed to puzzle them, and the conversation momentarily lapsed into silence. Teresa then asked if they had a death certificate or a will, to which they admitted they did not. She explained that they would need those documents to claim ownership at the county's record office if they truly believed the property belonged to them. My wife reacted poorly to Teresa's suggestion. She questioned Teresa's authority, accusing her of being overly nosy and demanding she mind her own business. It was embarrassing to witness. The neighborhood had been incredibly welcoming to me, and here was my ex-wife causing a scene. Despite my urge to intervene and defend Teresa, I stuck to our plan. Teresa, ever gracious, apologized for any misunderstanding and explained she was only trying to help. She then returned to her house, and shortly after, my ex-wife and daughter left. I was relieved they were gone but felt a strong sense of gratitude towards Teresa for handling the situation with such dignity, protecting both my privacy and peace. I made my way over to Teresa's house to apologize for the disturbance. She dismissed it with a wave of her hand, commending that while she found my wife's behavior distasteful, the outburst was somewhat amusing to her. I wished I could see the humor in it too, but knowing my wife's temper, I was concerned about what could happen if she returned. And indeed, she did come back the very next day. I was in my home office, deeply focused with my noise-canceling headphones on, when a loud crash jolted me out of my concentration. I hurried to the living room to discover my front window shattered. Outside, there was chaos, with neighbors trying to calm the situation. It turned out to be my ex-wife. She was the source of the commotion, having smashed the window herself. By the time I stepped outside, two of my elderly neighbors were trying their best to prevent her from doing further damage. Both she and Kelly were wielding bats and had already destroyed some of my potted plants. I caught hold of her arm and bluntly asked if she had lost her mind. 
Clearly taken aback by my presence, likely shocked to see me alive, I firmly told them to leave my property immediately or I would call the police. Unknown to me, my neighbors had already made the call. In her tone, she questioned why I hadn't reached out after recovering. She claimed that she and Kelly would have returned if they knew. I countered that when we married, we had vowed to support each other through sickness and health, a vow she had broken. I had no intention of rekindling our relationship. She was no longer my wife, as I had sent the divorce papers months ago. I reiterated my demand for them to leave. Then, she brought up our daughter, mentioning her upcoming college expenses and her inability to afford the tuition on her own. My response was cold but honest. I reminded her that Kelly had chosen to leave me too. I was prepared to relinquish all my parental rights. They should have considered the consequences of their actions before abandoning me. I wanted nothing to do with either of them. Her sadness quickly turned to anger as she called me selfish and heartless. This confrontation, though harsh, reaffirmed my decision to disconnect from a relationship that had left me isolated when I needed support the most. I couldn't help but find the irony in the situation slightly amusing. My ex-wife, of all people, was calling me selfish. In a moment of anger, I retorted, calling her an entitled jerk and firmly stating that she would not receive another dime from me. Just as I said this, she swung a bat at me, but the timing couldn't have been worse for her, as the police arrived just in that moment. The officers immediately intervened, arresting both her and my daughter. They inquired if I wanted to press charges, and without hesitation I agreed. As my ex and daughter were being led to the police car, they began crying loudly, but their tears did not move me. I had recorded the entire incident, including my wife smashing the window, and had already handed the footage over to the police. After finishing up my work for the day, I ordered a replacement for the broken window and started cleaning up the shattered glass. For the time being, I secured the window with a tarp to keep the elements out. Teresa kindly lent me some buckets to house my plants until I could get into pots. Curious about what drove my ex-wife to such extremes, I did some investigating. It turned out that her mother had passed away four months earlier, and they discovered that the house they were staying in belonged to her husband's cousin, not to them. The cousin had decided to evict them because he planned to sell the property. With nowhere to go following the sale of most of their belongings, my ex-wife and daughter had been living in a motel. Their desperation led them back to our old house, where seeing Hannah led them to wrongly assume I had died. They began souping around for any possible records of my assets or purchases, which eventually led them to me. Now they faced charges for vandalism, attempted break-in, and attempted assault. Since Kelly is a minor, she is sentenced to community service, but my ex-wife faces jail time for her premeditated actions. I am also considering obtaining a restraining order to ensure my safety and peace of mind. At least for now, I can rest easy knowing I won't have to deal with any further disruptions from her for quite some time. After not seeing him for a month, Kevin handed me a divorce lawyer's business card without even asking how I was doing. Divorcing a wife who doesn't work? Pay me $2,000 a month as alimony. Sounds good, take care, Kevin said with a chuckle, standing next to Julie who was wrapping her arm around him, both wearing smug expressions. Fine, let's divorce then. I said so casually that Kevin seemed a bit surprised, but he quickly shared his smile with Julie. Good thing Olivia isn't much of a thinker. It makes my plan easier to execute. After the divorce papers were approved, I decided to start my revenge plan on both of them. I will make them regret this as a celebration of my recovery. My name is Olivia Wilde. I'm a 50-year-old illustrator, and I also work as a children's book author. I love drawing. I have two childhood friends, Kevin and Julie. They're important to me, and Kevin is also my husband. It all started when Kevin asked me out as I was heading to a different college after high school. I was surprised. I thought he was into Julie. But I couldn't say no to a confession from Kevin, whom I had secretly liked. After some thought and talking it over with Julie, I accepted Kevin's proposal. Julie's behavior had been problematic since our teenage years, but she was still a dear friend to both Kevin and me. However, Julie had a tendency to steal other people's boyfriends and then dump them once they became obsessed with her, causing problems repeatedly. Her parents were concerned, so Kevin and I often spent time with her to keep an eye on her. Kevin and I got married when we were 23. Five years later, Julie introduced her fiancé, Paul, 
a professional working for a top-tier company. Nice to meet you, Olivia and Kevin. I've heard so much about you. Looking forward to our future together, Paul said politely when we met. We all got along well right away. During holidays and vacations, we would take trips or long train rides to enjoy some drinks together. However, things started to change after Julie got pregnant, three years into her marriage. Kevin and I had many siblings, so we were never worried about having our own children. We decided not to have kids. We both love kids but weren't interested in the responsibilities of raising them. Besides, we enjoyed our freedom to travel and have drinks. We often found it heartwarming to see families with children, but that was it. When Julie announced her pregnancy, Kevin's behavior began to change. He quit smoking because Julie couldn't stand the smell and even used his vacation days to drive her to doctor's appointments. I warned him, Paul might get upset if you're always with Julie. But Kevin argued back, you have work, don't you? She's our childhood friend and she need help. You're heartless, I said. I've been buying things and helping where I can, but going with her to the doctor is too much. Kevin frowned and then glared at me. Why? Because Julie wants it. She's anxious about the checkup. I can't just let her go alone if she's anxious. All the more reason for Paul to go with her, right? If you go with her every time, it's almost like you're the father of the baby, I replied. Jealous? You're not going to get pregnant anyway, so what's the problem? He snapped back. He didn't take my concerns seriously and started to get annoyed. We hardly ever fought during our marriage, but things changed when Julie got pregnant. Our arguments increased and didn't stop even after Julie gave birth. In fact, Kevin started spending even more time with Julie and their child, Lauren. But when Lauren was five, an incident occurred related to Lauren's graduation ceremonies. The day before the graduation, Kevin suddenly started rummaging through the closet. Kevin, what are you doing? I have a meeting tomorrow, he replied. Kevin's workplace had a casual dress code, but there was a rule to wear a suit during client meetings, so he always kept a few suits ready. Now, they were all thrown on the bed. Ah, no, just trying to decide what to wear for the graduation ceremony, he said, changing his answer. Are you really thinking of going to the graduation? Paul can't make it and Julie asked me, Kevin said. I was shocked and raised my voice without thinking. That's absurd, no matter how you look at it. Kevin's face turned sour immediately. I knew he sometimes picked Lauren up from kindergarten and I had too when asked. But it seemed ridiculous for a childhood friend, who wasn't even her biological parent, to attend a graduation ceremony. Do you still doubt me and Julie? I'm disappointed that you can't even help out, Kevin said. That's not the point. Anyway, I'm attending the graduation tomorrow. So iron a shirt properly, Kevin said, ending the conversation abruptly and walking to the bedroom. I had no choice but to call Julie. Hello, Julie, about tomorrow. Ah, sorry about tomorrow. I'm borrowing Kevin, but won't Paul be upset about the graduation attendance? Olivia, what are you talking about? Obviously, I haven't told Paul that the graduation is tomorrow. I'll tell him after the ceremony, Julie replied. I was shocked to learn that Paul didn't know about the graduation schedule. Upon further questioning, it seemed that Julie hadn't informed Paul about any of the kindergarten events so far, and Kevin had been acting as the father of the kindergarten, which made me feel dizzy with its selfishness. Wait a minute, Julie. Isn't that extremely unreasonable? It's disrespectful to Paul, I said. What's wrong, Olivia? You're scary. Well, see you tomorrow, Julie said, hanging up the phone unilaterally. Trembling with anger, I still ironed a shirt, prepared a tie, and the next morning saw Kevin off to Lauren's graduation ceremony. Since then, Julie and Kevin started going out more frequently, from once a month to once a week, and then to three times a week. Eventually, even Paul seemed to have some suspicions. One day, while Kevin and Julie were out, he visited our house alone late at night. I'm sorry for visiting you late at night. There's something that's been bothering me. 
Is it about the two of them? Paul asked. Yes, I would like you to take a look at this, Paul said, showing me the GPS history he had installed in Julie's car. It showed that she had been staying at a hotel three times a week. All of those days, she was out with Kevin. Just by looking at Paul's face, I understood what that meant. What do you want to do, Paul? I asked. I want to take revenge on those two, I said. Me too. I can't forgive them for betraying us after all this time, Paul agreed. We started planning our revenge in secret. First, I focused on increasing my income. Since I had been saving money by doing housework and taking care of Lauren, my income had decreased significantly. Paul switched to working from home. When Julie and Kevin would go out, he would bring Lauren to my house, and we would take care of her together. Neither Julie nor Kevin knew that we were aware of their affair, and we managed to gather solid evidence against them. Once we had collected enough evidence and were ready to take our revenge, we discovered a shocking truth about Lauren. Paul and I struggled with the decision, but we agreed that we didn't want to hurt young Lauren. So we decided to wait until she was an adult to take our revenge. However, even though we decided to wait for 12 years, I was struck with a serious illness that required long-term hospitalization. At best, I wouldn't be discharged for at least three years. Although I could work from the hospital room, it was clear that I would have to reduce my workload. After telling Paul about my situation, I consulted Kevin, but his reaction was indifferent, just like small talk. I'll visit you once in a while, he said. I felt that Kevin no longer cared for me, as he didn't even ask about my condition or the name of the disease. In reality, Kevin only visited once a month or once every two months. After Lauren's 17th birthday, she started acting strangely. Although she used to visit me almost every day right after I was hospitalized, she became distant after her birthday. Neither Paul nor I could figure out why. Even when we asked Lauren, she just said, don't worry about it. However, we ended up learning the reason from Kevin, who rarely showed up. Hey, it's been a while, he said casually, having completely changed into a flashy appearance. He walked in without knocking. After not seeing him for a month, Kevin just thrusts a divorce lawyer's business card at me without even asking how I was feeling. Divorcing a wife who doesn't work? Pay me $2,000 a month as alimony. That's the deal, so take care, Kevin said, grinning from ear to ear. Beside him, Julie wrapped her arms around Kevin, both wearing similar expressions on their faces. Fine, let's divorce then, I said. I agreed to the divorce casually, which surprised Kevin for a moment, but he quickly exchanged smiles with Julie. It was good that Kevin wasn't the type to think too deeply, that's why my plan worked so well. After I got the notification that the divorce was finalized from Kevin, I decided to start my revenge plan against the two of them. I was going to make them regret their actions as a way to celebrate my recovery. I immediately started to take action. First, I contacted Paul to arrange a transfer to a different hospital. Then, I informed my lawyer that they would be handling communications between us from now on. Paul also began to act. He moved near my new hospital with Lauren and started visiting me often. Lauren still looked sad, but I was happy she came to see me every day. Most of my belongings were already in the hospital room, so I told Kevin to get rid of the rest. I didn't want to keep anything that they might have touched in my new life. Once the hospital transfer and Paul and Lauren's move were settled, I received a call from Kevin. I had only been away from my phone for a few minutes, but there were already 50 missed calls. I answered the phone, feeling annoyed. What? Hey, what the hell is going on? I could hear the voice of a troubled real estate agent behind Kevin's panicked voice and Julie yelling, which made me feel sick. What do you mean? What's going on? It's obviously about the house. Why do we have to move out? Kevin shouted at me as if it wasn't his fault at all. Coolly, I replied, obviously, because that's my house. Kevin seemed to have completely forgotten 
But the truth was the house we lived in was a room I rented as a workspace when I started making a living as a freelancer. At that time, I didn't have enough income to maintain three houses, and Kevin didn't have enough income to live alone, so he ended up moving into my place. Therefore, Kevin had never paid the rent or utility bills for that room. Although I received some money from him for living expenses, it wasn't enough to maintain the place. Unfortunately, that room was already cancelled. It was far from the hospital I transferred to, so I had processed the cancellation the day after submitting the divorce papers. I didn't tell him because the real estate agent, who knew about our situation, said they would contact him. Suddenly, Paul and Lauren disappeared, and our house was sold. What are we going to do about our new house? Kevin asked. I don't know, maybe stay in a business hotel for now, I said as I turned on the speaker and started working. Kevin yelled in frustration, don't mess with me. However, he seemed to remember something and started speaking in a more soothing tone. Well, whatever, when will you transfer the money? We're running low on cash. What are you talking about? Don't mess around. I told you to pay $22,000, didn't I? He asked. Oh, I don't recall agreeing to that. I responded calmly, which was met with incoherent screaming from Kevin on the other end of the phone. Apparently, he thought he could get money from me and had been spending carelessly. Even if you had $22,000 left, how did you plan to get by for the rest of the month? I questioned. Hey, don't just stay silent, say something, he demanded. There's really nothing to talk about, I retorted, leaving Kevin momentarily dumbfounded. But he soon started yelling again. Growing increasingly annoyed, I addressed Kevin in as cheerful a tone as I could muster. Anyway, we're basically strangers now, so please don't contact me anymore. You'll hear from my lawyer. Huh? Lawyer? Hey, wait a minute. Kevin tried to respond but I hung up without listening. He tried calling back several times, but I ignored it, and eventually the calls stopped. However, angry that I didn't answer, Kevin started ignoring calls from my lawyer. He certainly had a childish side, but I never imagined he'd be the kind of person who didn't mind causing trouble for others. I sighed deeply at Kevin's selfishness. A few months later, after a temporary discharge from the hospital, I visited Kevin's parents' house. In front of me were Kevin and Julie, both looking small and trembling. You telling my parents is a low blow, Kevin said. Oh, I just reported that we got divorced, I replied calmly. Kevin glared at me in response, but he shrank back under his father's stern gaze. Actually, I had a great relationship with my in-laws, even visiting and dining with them when Kevin wasn't around. Despite being so well-loved, I felt it was important to share the details of our divorce. I went to visit Kevin's parents. Is it true that you're remarrying Julie? I asked. Yes, it's true. Julie, Lauren, and I are going to start over as a family, Kevin replied. What are you talking about? Your only family is Olivia, his father said, clearly upset. She's not my family anymore, Kevin replied, which made his father frown in disbelief. Kevin shook his head a few times, then handed me a piece of paper. It was a bill from a nearby luxury hotel. What's this? I asked. It's the bill from the hotel we stayed at, Kevin said, as if it was obvious, and pointed at the bill on the table. Then he suddenly collapsed. Oh, what the heck, Mom? I didn't raise you to be like this, my mother-in-law gasped for breath, looking at Kevin with disbelief. Next to him, Julie wore the same expression. Why are you so angry? It's just that the family is changing because I'm getting married. Plus, you'll have a grandchild, a blood-related one at that. Aren't you happy? Ken said. You two didn't. My mother-in-law, looking as if she couldn't believe what she was hearing, glanced at them, then turned her gaze to me. Both my in-laws knew I didn't want children and still treated me as their own daughter. Of course, they treated Julie, my childhood friend, similarly, but there was always a boundary between a daughter-in-law and a friend. I remember Julie often complaining about that, so I was certain my mother-in-law wouldn't be happy about this situation, 
and Julie should have known it too. You do want Lauren, right? It'll be your grandchild, so you'll be happy, right? It's because she's a child I've known since she was little. Oh, but half of her blood is from Kevin, right? Julie said, showing no remorse and acting as if she couldn't understand the problem, which was unsettling. At that moment, someone who had been silent until now spoke up. Enough already, it's disgusting, Lauren, who had been playing with her smartphone in the corner of the room, spoke to Julie without looking up. The room fell into a stunned silence. My dad is the only one I consider my father, whether we're related by blood or not. He's the only one. But you know, Kevin has always been the one to attend your school events, Lauren continued. I heard everything from dad, how he was always informed of the event dates after they were over, how eventually even the events themselves were kept from him. But dad always said I was his daughter, so I am his daughter, and I will never be yours. Lauren glared at Julie as she said this, then sitting beside me, she switched to a more concerned tone. You know, when I found out about this, I thought you would hate me, but dad said that wasn't the case, so I came here today. Lauren, I love you so much. You were so kind to visit me every day while I was in the hospital. I was really happy, Olivia said. Lauren, perhaps relieved of her anxiety, teared up and hugged me tightly. It might indeed be a child resulting from an affair between Kevin and Julie, yet it's a child I've taken care of for 16 years. There's no way I don't have affection for her, I continued. Speaking of which, Julie, weren't you curious why I wasn't surprised when I found out Lauren is Kevin's daughter? I asked. Julie looked startled, but before she could speak, a new person entered the room. We knew from the start, 12 years ago, actually, Paul suddenly appeared, which was understandable as he had recently asked for a divorce due to irreconcilable differences. I was shocked when you mentioned divorce. Oh, and unfortunately, you're not divorced yet. The divorce papers are still here, didn't you notice? I figured it wasn't in Julie and Kevin's nature to confirm things. But I couldn't help but be stunned that Julie, despite the 200-day waiting period for women to remarry, had not noticed for months. So Julie is still my wife, and Lauren is still my daughter. Well, since there won't be a wife though, Julie interrupted, Wait, what do you mean? A 16-year-old can choose their parent. That's not true. Lauren wants to be with mom, right? Julie said that and looked at Lauren. Lauren frowned at Julie and held my hand. Julie was speechless at that and glared at me. Then Kevin suddenly burst into laughter. So that's what it is, you two are together, huh? But too bad, isn't it impossible to live on Paul's salary alone? Can you stop making weird assumptions? Also, it seems Paul earns double the amount you think, I replied. Julie probably knew about it, but it might just be a bluff. Besides, it's impossible for you to work while dealing with your illness. You'll just die miserably somewhere, Kevin said. This time, I laughed at Kevin's huge misunderstanding. Seeing me laugh, Kevin started getting frustrated. You didn't know about my income, did you? It's probably just a bit more than a part-time job, no. It's different. My annual income is $800,000, I said. Kevin's eyes and mouth were wide open in shock. Julie was also stunned. In fact, over the past 12 years, I have become a popular children's book author and my income has really gone up because of essays, interviews, and more. There's even a movie based on my books coming soon, so I'm earning even more. Oh, do you want to see this? I said and showed Julie my bank account on my phone. It clearly showed a lot of money being deposited every month. Julie was speechless when she saw it. Olivia, let's uh, make up, huh? Kevin said, sounding hopeful. What are you saying? Julie was angry at Kevin's words. I just watched them quietly, then finally spoke. Well, if you want to get married, feel free. Oh, and I'll definitely take the compensation for damages. Olivia, wait. Kevin called out, but I ignored him. I took Lauren's hand, said goodbye to my in-laws, and left their house. Kevin used to work at my father-in-law's company, 
but it was discovered he lied about going out for sales, and he was fired. My father-in-law planned to make him work on a friend's fishing boat, which was tough for Kevin who preferred indoor work. He tried to contact me several times, but I always let my father-in-law know, and eventually, Kevin stopped calling. Julie lost custody of Lauren to Paul and got divorced. She seemed uninterested in Kevin, who couldn't afford luxuries anymore, and didn't chase after him. She was cut off by her family and lived alone in a rundown apartment. She hadn't worked since getting married and had always relied on others, so she found it hard to do things on her own. There were hardly any places that would hire her full-time, but she needed to pay for her living expenses and child support, so she worked multiple part-time jobs and barely made ends meet. After starting high school, Lauren worked hard every day to study abroad and go to a prestigious university overseas. Being originally diligent, her dream is to translate my picture books and deliver them to children all over the world, which makes me happy. As for me, my picture books are selling well, and I'm getting more offers for animated adaptations and merchandise. My health is also getting better, and although I'm still in the hospital, my doctor recently told me that I might be able to leave the hospital next year. One more thing, Paul and Lauren come to visit me every day. Paul recently confessed to me with remarriage in mind. I haven't given my answer yet, but I can't help but have feelings for him. He said he wants to live together when I leave the hospital. While thinking about what to answer, I work on my picture books every day, hoping for a happy future for us. I weave stories again today.